In the old days, this would say something like Chicago Radio, but I see that it says. We're obviously broadcasting from NGMA Radio now. But let me just say how deeply moved I am, first of all, by this absolutely extraordinary exhibition. This, as Nancy said, the, the long arc of, of Sudhir's practice, which uh, brings us back into epiphanies we've had before, and we see them again in a new light, but also the number of surprises that, that await us. Now, Nancy, you very kindly referred to the books I wrote on Sudhir, but when I stand in the presence of this exhibition which you've so magisterially curated, I just think this is a completely new painter whose works I'm experiencing for the first time. There's also been 14 or more years since those books appeared where uh, Sudhir's work has taken extraordinary, taken an extraordinary new direction. So in every way, I think, whether it's someone who comes all fresh to Patwardhan's work or someone who's followed his career for a while, this, this is an extremely special and important exhibition, this retrospective. And um, it's also a, a, a real honor to, to, to follow both of your presentations, Liv and Nancy, because they affirm for us the renewed and relevance of the painter's art. I have absolutely nothing against other media. I sometimes come across as a conservative when I talk about uh, video and installation and so forth. Each one of these forms of articulation, artistic articulation are extremely important. But there is sometimes a tendency that people fall into to arrange media or forms of art in some kind of chron chronology or teleology. And there's, a, a work like this and reflections like these just remind us that uh, painting can still uh, leap ahead of some of the other forms. It can still show the way and it can certainly be uh, crafty in the way in which it approaches the world and it's something to cherish really. So what I'm going to do is to, this painting that you see here is from 1985. It's called Street Corner and it is in the exhibition. Uh, it's uh, in the Tapi collection, if I remember correctly. Now, the reason I have it here is uh, because I want to, my, my, my way of approaching this, this work might be slightly different. Because uh, um, in terms of tonality from what, is, what has gone before, what fascinates me and has always fascinated me about Sudhir's work is the key question of the artist's location in relation to his subject. That, that he's always at. And at one point, he brought into play this extraordinary trope, which he referred to as behalfism. And uh, he would say, what is my right, what is my locus standi as an artist to turn someone outside of myself into a subject? Uh, what is my right to represent another milieu, another reality? Uh, through the early years of his career, from, say, 1975 through to uh, the late to the early 90s, that question revolved around his deep preoccupation with the working class, with questions of justice and equity, and uh, in major paintings that all of us are familiar with, Accident on May Day, for instance, to name but one, or Street Play, which Nancy showed, these paintings encoded all of the choices he'd made and the dilemmas. The question was, uh, does the artist somehow, like the anthropologist, stand outside of what is being borne witness to? Or is there going to be an immersion? Will there be a releasement of the artistic self towards and into the subject? And for me, this painting, which more or less appears in what you could see is the 10th year of his formal practice, uh, is the earliest works uh, on my date back to 1975. In 1985, he completes 10 years of, um, of, of his practice. By this time, he has already been in Place for People, 1981. And uh, there is, to my mind, in this work, a sort of standing back from a close and powerful engagement with the working class, with labor agitations, with such scenarios as the strike and the protest. And in that case, what is the kind of collective that is being responded to? I think that's, that for me is one of the, one of the key questions here. And um, I think it's, it represents one of several choices that Sudhir made at this time. Because really, if you look at it, the question for him was also 
uh, both of you placed several dialectics in, in, in play. Uh, and I would offer another one, which Sudhir has been greatly exercised by, which is the kind of dialectic between intimacy and distance. And for instance, in a work like Street Play, which you showed earlier, I think one of the solutions to this question of how close can I get to my subject, how far away should I be, took the form of engaging with a single group, a single figure defined by its own activity or in relation to a few other figures, a kind of tableau, not necessarily a large group. And street play, I think, was, uh, was a painting that reflects that kind of choice. But I think at the same time, Sudhir was concerned that isolating a figure might move him towards, give to use your term, to idealize the isolated portrait. I think there was a slight fear of that. So then he makes a second move and then situates the figure in a more elaborate, enigmatic kind of context, whether it's the, an interior or a topography. And uh, Ceremony, which is from the Nicholson collection and is here, uh, is that kind of work. You'll all know these works. I'm not going to show them. Uh, where you're not quite sure what is going on, and I think your affect as a viewer gets caught up with, in some way, decoding the proceedings and trying to figure out how one might, as a viewer, respond to what is going on. So I think that was a second sort of solution to this question of intimacy and distance, also idealizing and real, realism, not idealizing. A third move at this point for Sudhir was to embrace a large and complex social reality. So instead of identifying necessarily as a spokesperson or a fellow traveler of one class or one political tendency, he moved towards assembling a people landscape. And you see that in, in canonical works in his over like, like Town and Nullo, because these are panoramic views of a Tane that is still taking shape. It's, it's being built. There is human agency and endeavor. There's hope, aspiration. There's also uh, jerry-built structures, there's a certain exploitation of landscape, there is an identifiable locale that human activity is producing, and there are also different kinds of exchanges among people that are yet being negotiated. So whether it's the mason or the carpenter or the entrepreneur or the passerby on a cycle or whoever it might be, these social relationships in paintings like Town and Nala have not yet stabilized in any way. So I think that was yet another, a third move by which Sudhir tried to move away from this question of uh, seeing society as a fairly clear hierarchy of classes and having to position oneself accordingly. But that tended to monumentalize the landscape. So for me, I think the, what I'm looking at, what fascinates me about this part of, of Sudhir's journey, um, given Nancy, I would have to say, is the, the ability to bear witness to a complex, granular social reality on the one hand, and the fear that one might be monumentalizing it in some way. And I think in town and Nala, that's the crisis. That's the question that's being, uh, as always, I have the sense that one is talking at the artist who is sitting haplessly by listening to what is being said about him. But, um, but I think this is, this is something that one might read in those works. So, and in order to then move away, I mean, it's a kind of shuttle that you see. Because that people landscape has been so monumental, uh, Sudhir then enacts a, uh, quirky, quizzical sort of move. He then moves back to the portrait, the singular isolated figure, but it's a figure that you can't readily identify because it's, it's an amalgam of different kinds of things. And here, uh, those are some of my favorite works actually, the Deccani head, the Mughal head, where you're not sure whether you're looking at a Bahamani courtier or a visitant from the future or a cosmonaut or who exactly are you looking at. So the effect of that is again to take away from the kind of monumental splendor of an isolated portrait or this grandiose sense of a peopled landscape and to then be involved, to have your affect involved in this kind of decoding. So I think what we're also looking at here is an ability to make clear through your painted images and a desire to withhold meaning, to be mysterious, to be enigmatic. So again, when I look back, it looks like a series of steps that a chess master was making. When you look at the paintings, of course, there's always a to and fro. There's a shuttle among these choices because painters, as we know, uh, are not chess masters. I mean, these moves 
penetrate each other, they shuffle. You see some of these strategies active together at the same time in works. So in, in my reading, this is, these are some of the things that, was going on, that were going on in, in Sudhir's work at this time. But where that brings him in 1985 is really to a painting like this, where suddenly, rather than the tight close-up or the panoramic uh, sort of long view, what he does is to settle for a median scale, as I like to think of it. It's just close enough for you to be able to reach out and touch the lives of the people you're looking at, and yet it's far away enough that you can't actually enter and take sides in any way. So this scale, this focal length, this what I call this median scale, is something that fascinates me about, about this, uh, this painting particularly. And um, I've seen, I've looked at this painting many, many times over the years, and each time I think of what kind of context it inhabits, a different sort of context. It's a nocturne, it's a night painting. And it certainly draws on, uh, could I have the next slide, please? Something, what you're looking at here is Peter de Hook. It's uh, two, when, two women beside a linen chest with the child. It's oil on canvas, 1663. So we're also looking at a transcultural, cosmopolitan artistic imagination that reaches back to, in this case, to Dutch painting. To, uh, could we have the next one, please? Or this one, the love letter of a mere painting from uh, a few years after that, about 1670. So, uh, could we now go back to the Sudhir Patwardhan painting? Yeah. So, if you look at, if I had a pointer, if I had a pointer, I would ask you to look right in the middle of the the ground floor, for instance. If you look at the deep recessive kind of space that's invoked there, this median scale also becomes a kind of. Uh, if you will, a puzzle painting, where different kinds of, of, uh, of, of planarity and recession is, is being brought into play. And instead of milkmaids or sleeping servants or a little domestic intrigues, what you find is a woman making chapatis. Now, I'm at a kind of angle, so there she is, the woman making chapatis. There's a boy who's studying, there's a child who's asleep. Uh, up there, there's... Um, a, a musical uh, uh, riyaz going on, a man in a kurta with a jhola, a classic sort of activist writer who actually looks like Vasanta Bhaji Dahake, the poet, is sort of crossing the road. There's people who seem to be falling asleep from a long day of work. The, the quotidian routines are, are, are invoked here. And Again, I, it's, it's a real period piece in a strange way because that Lambretta scooter represents a certain kind of aspiration for a certain kind of class from the late 70s and 80s in a way. And um, what I find truly, truly intriguing about this work is the way in which it brings together, again, this is a key question for Sudhir, I think from the beginning to the present to now, it is what holds a society together? What makes a collective? Is it class relations? Is it class tension? Is it the ability to respect the fact that different trajectories can coexist at the same time? And I think that's a question that faces, we have been forced to confront that question today, especially in this last week. This is a question that has preoccupied all of us in this room and millions of our compatriots outside. And a painting like this, restful as it seems, still brings us back into the presence of questions like this. Uh, whether it's the, the bright beam from the scooter's headlight, again, I wish I had a pointer. I'm also looking now at the, the details that seem physically necessary to build the work, but which also seem to have a certain kind of metaphorical implication. Uh, there's a light breeze that lifts the clothes. There are, these, are, these are, to my mind, the invisible, impalpable elements of the painting, and this is, this is an aspect of the painter's art that has endlessly fascinated me. How do you use the materiality of pigment and brushwork, the agency of brushwork to invoke things that you couldn't actually touch or feel in actual life? That this, this paradox of the palpable and the impalpable is I think at the heart of all great painting. So again, whether it's the, the beam from the scooter's headlight or the light breeze that's, that's moving the clothes up there in the top right hand corner, 
or the edge of the Mangalore tile roof, which just sort of breaks, the, if you will, the precision of the frame. There's a certain being at an angle that you find there. And uh, the resigned expression of the woman who's making the chapatis. Now, you, uh, could we move forward, please, to the next slide? Ah, we've moved here already. Okay. So, not only are we brought into a space of different sorts of affect and different ways of expressing our empathy towards these lives with which we may or may not have anything in common, but there's also something else that I find going on in, uh, in a painting like this. And now I move to what I think of as the etymologies of these works. What you're looking at here is Behzad, uh, Kamaluddin Behzad, the great Safavid artist. And uh, it's around this time also that uh, that Sudhir was looking at ways in which this kind of social granularity could be pictorially expressed. And to that end, he was, of course, the, Behzad is my particular fascination, but uh, it's, it's an indulgence on my part to have it here. What I should have had uh, would be the Mughal uh, paintings, that the Mughal miniatures, the Mughal murakas that Sudhir was really looking at at this period. Again, going back to a period in picture making, which, by the way, for me is a very good term, and not to put down, uh, because you do have to make, make pictures in complex ways. Uh, so Sudhir was looking back to the art of a court, which was also coming together at that point. It was, it was made in a sequence of Mughal reigns where, again, social, political, ethnic, and religious relationships were all being renegotiated. And the way those mechanisms of renegoti renegotiation were enacted are visible in those paintings, whether in terms of scale or in terms of how architecture gets represented. And I think there were valuable lessons there that were both formal as well as conceptual, and we could probably talk about this later. Uh, could we have the last one, please? Oh, not yet the last one. Yeah, uh, no, no, sorry, uh, the one before that. Just to say that this was, in terms of context, this was also the sort of preoccupation that uh, moved, this is Gulam, Gulam Sheikh's work that you're looking at, City for Sale, uh, also done around the same time. It was, uh, it was a little before, 1984. We're looking here at a phalanx of artists, Sudhir, Give, Gulam, Nalini Malani, Vivan Sundaram, a number of artists who were reinventing uh, the language of painting at this point, uh, through the early 80s. And we're not proceeding in any direct lineage, but we're taking things from, from wherever uh, there were pointers or prompts or lineages that could be crafted. So I also want Street Corner to remind us of that experimental and inventive moment where you have, in, to use Eliot's terminology, you have the individual talent phrasing a tradition for itself. Uh, and again, in a way that brought together the life of the street right outside, the fluorescence of neon and of uh, popular culture, equally the kind of acid yellows and greens you would see in an El Greco painting, and also Sienese paintings and the way in which they managed large assemblies of, of, uh, of people, of individuals. Now we'll have the last one, please. <laughs> And I'm going to close with this, with this, um, this painting from Giotto's Scroveni Chapel, uh, which some of us actually visited together some years ago. It is, as many of you know, a fresco cycle which dwells on the life and, and death and resurrection of Christ. And I have it here again to place in mind the strange and mysterious ancestries of paintings that we regard as very much our own, part of our context, part of our social and political questions. And um, I'll end by thinking about how Sudhir's ability to reach out to many of these paintings that come from, this is from the beginning of the Trecento, it's, it was completed in 1305. Uh, why would someone like Sudhir Patwardhan dealing with questions of post-colonial India, a polarized society, the claims of the left, the challenges of the right, why would he go back to the beginning of the Trecento and, and uh, engage with, uh, with, a, with a completely religious artist and a cycle of paintings that bore witness to that? Multiple reasons. In a conversation we had, uh, at one point Sudhir told me that 
even as he wrestled with these social questions, that what was very important for him, and I quote him, is the need to recapture the pure joy of seeing and painting. And I think that notion of pleasure and finding ancestries for painterly pleasure is something that I would also like to, to leave you with as a, as a thought. And also a suggestion that even as artists feel they need to reach out to their audiences and find language that is common, there will always be something tangential and eccentric and mysterious things from elsewhere and elsewhere that the artist brings into play. And it is our responsibility as viewers to bridge that gap in a certain way. Thank you so much for your attention.